Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to open hearing number three, that is the case 13,349, Jorge, Jorge Luis de la Rosa Mejia et al against Colombia. I would like to greet the delegation of the state as well as the representatives of the victim. My name is Julissa Mantilla Falcom. I'm the president of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. Um, um, I'm today with Estuardo Rallon, Commissioner Joel Hernandez and Commissioner Roberta Clark. Today, I would like to take the floor to Assistant Executive Secretary, Secretary Marisol Blanchard. Thank you, Madam President. Good morning to everyone. The present case has to do with the alleged responsibility of the state of Colombia for the alleged forced disappearance of Jorge Luis de la Rosa Mejia, Fabio Luis Colei Coronado, Sadid Elena Mendoza Perez, and Aida Cecilia Padilla Mercado by paramilitary groups with the complicity and acquiescence of the state. They also allege the situation of impunity for said facts. In July 2017, Commission approved the admissibility report. In said report, the Commission accepted the admissibility of the facts uh, or the case based on articles 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, 22, and 25 of the American Convention in relation to Article 1.1 of that instrument, Article 1 of the inter of the Convention of Force Disappearance and Article uh, 1, 3 and 7 of the Convention for the Sanction or Prevention of Torture. Um, the hearing is aimed at providing information about the case by the parties. The Commission will listen to the declaration and the statements of the alleged victims. Thank you, Madam Press, uh, Madam Secretary. Uh, first, I would like to explain the methodology of this hearing, especially for those people who are just joining, because this is a case hearing and hearing, and it's different from the other ones. First, we will have the statements of Miss Laura Carolina Colley, and also from um, Miss De La Rosa. I will ask her to identify themselves, and then we will have the questioning from the petitioner, then we will for 10 minutes, then the state will have 10 minutes to ask questions. And finally, the commission will have 10 minutes for asking questions. After that, we will continue with the allegations part. These allegations part will start with the petitioners for 10 minutes, then the state for 10 minutes, and then we will have the replies for five minutes. And then the commission will end the hearing with some interventions. After this explanation, we will begin with the statement of Laura Carolina Colley. Please indicate your full name, your place of birth, and your place of residence to start with the questioning. Good afternoon. My name is Ana Carolina Colley. I am from, I'm living in Bogota, Colombia. My Name of ID is, uh, she read her ID number. You can proceed. The petitioners can proceed with their questions. Thank you, Madam President. My name is Moises David Mesa. I'm the lawyer. Laura Fernanda, please indicate what's your relationship with Fabio Luis Colet Coronado as a family member of Fabio Luis. My relationship with Fabio Luis Cole Coronado, I'm her, his daughter, his first daughter. His family was made up of her, his wife, Olivia, and my two brothers, uh, Fabio Andres Cole Diaz and Maria Alejandra Cole Diaz. Thank you, Laura. I would like to know the how the family relationship was. My father was a lovely man. She was, he was a, the, the foundation of our family. He taught us so many values to persevere, to fight for justice, to believe in justice. He taught us that. He taught us that justice existed and uh, that he 
try to guide us in our jobs, in our professions. Uh, he was a lovely man and he was the fundamental pillar of our family. Thank you. Um, how were the conditions of Fabio Luis within the CTI, the corpse? My father was an investigator of the CTI in the prosecutor's office, and his situation was a high risk situation. Since um, over his years as an investigator, there were several events that occurred. For example, there was a kidnapping. He was the victim of a kidnapping in 1998, he was kidnapped by the AUC while he was conducting some work to capture a former municipal councillor in Algarrobo. He was kidnapped by that paramilitary group in Sierra Nevada where Hernán Quiral was chief. And he was released seven days later after a lot of work conducted by my family, by all, a lot of efforts. The following year, taken into consideration that according to his investigation, he was able to identify people who were financing para, paramilitarism in the region. My father was declared a military target. And this was published on mass media. And my father and his family were left in a very serious security situation. We knew that we were at risk because the whole country knew about what was happening on radio, the press. And that's why the prosecutor's office decided to transfer him to Tunja City. And there, we started to leave this specific situation because he was transferred to Tuja and he felt punished by his transfer. He cannot perform his role, what he was used to do, to doing. He could not conduct investigations that he was conducting uh, into paramilitarism and he had not the same funding. As a result of this, he felt very frustrated. We perceived this as family members. He told us so in spite of the fact that we were children, we knew this. My father uh, was sent by the unit of human rights to investigate the massacres that occurred that year in Chenge and also in El Salado. These were massacres which were uh, known by the country and at an international level. My father was order to conduct this mission. Thank you, Laura. Why do you think that uh, Fabio was ordered to conduct this mission in a place that was so dangerous in spite of his insecurity situation and the insecurity situation of your family? We cannot understand it. We cannot understand how the government of Colombia and the prosecutor's office, in spite of knowing about the situation of my father who had been kidnapped by the paramilitary group, my father had been declared a military target and he was sent to that dangerous place uh, to conduct this investigation. What I do believe 
is that my father was professionally able. He had proved in his work that he was an excellent investigator and that he was well aware of the management of the paramilitary structure in the country. Thank you. The family, once the family was aware of the disappearance of Fabio Luis, what did you do before the authorities of the state and how they reacted? Well, we protested, we went to, pre to the press, we went to the prosecutor's office, we went to public prosecutor office. We also made or organized sit-ins or protests and the response was delayed. The investigation, the ex officio investigation started a week later. The prosecutor office started to investigate the case ex officio late. We couldn't understand this because my father was an official of the prosecutor office and he was at risk. He was, if he were left there and he, if he were sent there, he would have been, he would be exposed because he was identified as a target. They knew that he was investigating them. Thank you. Can you explain the impact on the family after the disappearance of your father? As a family, it's been terrible. They took our pillar. They took the structure of our family, the foundation of our family. Our father, who was the guide, the pillar of our family. My grandparents were highly affected. Their health was highly affected. And my sister, who was two by then, grew up without my dad, without knowing who he was. She only knew about him because of what we said about him. And it's really sad. Thank you, Laura. Finally, my last question. What are the family's reparation expectations? Well, over all these years fighting as a family, the only thing that we want is to have a conviction that or a ruling that shows or that proves that the justice, justice exists because we cannot find that in Colombia. We cannot achieve that in Colombia. We hope that this is the light that we have been searching for for a very long time. Thank you, Laura. We want to express our solidarity. That's all on our side, Madam President. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to give the floor now to the representatives of the state for the questioning for 10 minutes. Thank you, Madam President. Laura Carolina, first of all, the state understands and would like to express its solidarity for your suffering over all these years in relation to the situation of your father. We would like to ask you a few specific questions. The first one is, if during your statement, you talked about the frustration your father was feeling after his transfer, do you know if his supervisors in Tunja knew about this situation? Yes, yes. My father was promised a promotion because obviously, obviously he gave all the reasons why he should be promote, promoted, but that promotion was never given. He was transferred and he could not give 
him that position and that's why my father was not promoted. They knew about this. Laura Carolina. Laura Carolina. Do you believe taking into consideration that feeling of frustration your father had? Do you believe that that mission taken into consideration his frustration? Do you think that the mission was okay for him? No. I am sure that he did it because he loved his work, his job, because he knew that he was going to investigate the perpetrators of massacres that had so many victims. There were so many people suffering, so many people disappeared. In order to investigate those who disappeared, there were those massacres. And for those massacres, my father died. disappeared. Finally, Laura Carolina, during your statement, you made reference to a specific paramilitary group who certainly threatened your father. And this led to the situation for which you had to be transferred to Tunja City. Do you know if that paramilitary group was operating in the place where the facts took place? They are the AUC and it's a paramilitary structure. They were communicate, communicated between them. There were some chiefs in some areas, but they were communicated the chiefs were communicated. They, they were structured. It was a paramilitary structure, as you know. So they had the same boss and that structure was communicated. Madam President, the state has no further questions. Thank you very much, sir. Ms. Laura Carolina, now we will start with the participation of the commission. So I will first ask my colleagues if they have any particular questions, they will ask and you uh, will have to answer. First of all, I would like to ask the country reporter, Commissioner Hernandez, do you have any questions? Yes, Madam President, thank you very much. I would like to greet Ms. Laura Carolina Colei Diaz. Um, in your answers to your attorney, you said that you had to call the um, public prosecution's um, attention so that they would move forward with the investigation. What kind of actions did you have to uh, recur to for them to act? You said that you had to protest for them to start investigation. Um, did that happen the first time he disappeared during the kidnapping or the second time when he was finally disappeared? And is this something that is usually done so that investigations will begin or was this an exception, your particular situation? Thank you. Go ahead, Ms. Laura. Yes. We as I was very young, my mom knocked on everyone's door, every institution, public prosecutors, controllers, ombudsperson, everyone. Now, with regards to the protests, yes, since there, there was no uh, progress in the investigations, they even started investigating for kidnapping. That is why all the other the mechanisms they used, they used were about kidnapping and not forced disappearance. They stopped um, considering the crime of forced disappearance in my father's case, when it was evident that this was a forced disappearance, not a kidnapping. So they needed to activate an urgent search mechanism. Thank you. 
first Vice President Stuardo Rallon. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Madam President. Yes, I do have a question. First of all, I would like to greet in solidarity Ms. Colley. My question has to do with the search for her father. Were you informed on whether there's an ongoing search plan for your father? Have you received any information on the progress or the challenges facing the search? That's my question. Well, all the information the family has received has been through our attorneys. In this case, the CCJ has been giving us information on the progress of the investigation, and they are the ones who notify us about the hearings so we can attend them. And this was done through our attorneys. If there's any progress in the criminal processes for justice and peace, there has been some, but no truth has been found. And it's we believe that the state have just assumed that the stories of some paramilitaries, some of them, not all of them, they say that they threw the remains at sea. So I think that is why they have decided not to investigate anymore or to compare any other remains that are found uh, in places where my father's remains could be. Thank you very much. I will now give the floor to Commissioner Clark. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, President. And I, uh, Laura Carolina, I, I joined my commissioners in extending um, my solidarity to you and your family on this terrible loss, this terrible and profound loss. I have three questions all around the theme of the connection between the paramilitary group and the state authorities. Um, so the first question is, in regard to the kidnapping, the first kidnapping, is there any evidence, do you have any evidence, is there a suggestion that there was a link between the kidnappers and the state authorities? That's my first question. My second question is, when uh, your father went missing within the first week, as you said, and your mother um, was anxiously visiting state authorities to try to get the investigation um, going, what was the response? What response did you re receive in the course of that week? And then uh, my last question, what, uh, what to you suggests evidence that there was a link between the paramilitary group and the state authorities? Thank you very much. Go ahead, Miss Laura. Okay. Originally, when my father was kidnapped, the, as far as I know, there was um, there wasn't much truth found about that kidnapping, but it is supposed that because of the um, arrest of that political leader, that's why he was kidnapped. With regards to the forced disappearance, the activity of the authorities was practically inexisting. We had to wait for a full week. All the, the, the first hours were wasted. The first hours that were essential to to find him where something could actually be done to rescue those persons alive or to set them free to get them back evidently there was complicity at all levels of the economic and political power and between the paramilitary groups and the states, starting with the governor of the department where my father was disappeared, who was convicted for fostering paramilitarism in Colombia. He was convicted by the Supreme Court of Colombia. So definitely there was a link because paramilitary groups had infiltrated all institutions 
there are actual reports where um, investigators of the CTI say that there were people, that there were two people from Cartagena who said that they had access to um, information, to the human rights uh, unit information, and they were the ones who told the paramilitary that my father was in that region and what kind of work he was doing there. Thank you very much, Ms. Laura Carolina. I have some questions as well. I will um, ask one, actually. Um, first of all, I would like to know if you and your family, if you have, if you suffered any sort of threats to, uh, towards your life and your integrity during the search, could you re reply to that first? Yes. Throughout our entire lives, we were basically displaced because of the threats, because of the kidnapping. We lived in fear. If a car approached our house and we weren't expecting it, my grandmother would tell us, go hide under the bed, just because of, of the sight of a car. And that's how we lived. Thank you, Ms. Laura. And my final question goes beyond my role as vice pres as president of the commission. I am the rapporteur for women here. There's an impact of forced disappearances beyond um, victims because this there is an impact on women. So I had asked about reparations. What has been the impact on the women of your family? You talk about the daughters, your mother. I would like you to tell us a little bit more about that. Well, let's start with his mother. She lost her son. And she is, she has been lost in her pain, in her constant torture. My grandmother stopped wearing colors. She started suffering from a heart condition. My mother was left all alone with three children. She was the she had to study, she had to work. She was the breadwinner. She had to try to find my father. She had to protect us. She had to go to the areas where my father could be. She had to receive every threat without being able to say a thing. In, and our, and their daughters, we grew up in fear, surrounded by impunity. We felt invisible, unseen. And sometimes they, they think they are better than us. My youngest brother, without that father figure, a figure that um, was uh, was who was someone that we spoke so highly of. Everyone speaks so highly of my dad, but he never got to meet him, to know him. Thank you, Laura Carolina, our commission. Thanks you for your being here. Uh, we uh, run over the time for one minute. I will discount that of my own time. Thank you very much. We will move on to the second statement. Ms. Jacqueline de la Rosa. I will ask her to identify herself with her name, her place of birth, and where she currently lives. Good afternoon. My name is Jacqueline Paulina de la Rosa Viña. My ID number is 57-426-718. I'm in Santa Marta in Colombia. That's where I live. Thank you very much. I will give the floor to uh, the your representation. Thank you very much, Madam President. Ms. Jacqueline, could you tell us your relationship with Jorge Luis de la Rosa and uh, the structure of the family? My relationship to Jorge Luis, I was his sister. I am his sister. 
our family was made up of my father, Orlando de la Rosa, who passed away. Menia Salas, who also passed away, my oldest brother, who also passed away, Germán de la Rosa Mejín, then me, Jacqueline Paulina de la Rosa, and the youngest brother was my brother, Jorge, who disappeared. And what about his daughters? Yes, his family was made up of his wife, Mary of Gregory Tejeda, and his daughter, Marilyn de la Rosa Gregory, and Karina Andrea de la Rosa Gregory. That was the family he had after us. Thank you very much, Miss Jacqueline. Could you please tell us about the family relationship and in particular, the working life of Jorge Luis, his work conditions, the, if he was protected? Well, he was the youngest, so he was very close to his father's family. And then he had his family with Marley, and it was a lovely relationship because he was so overprotective. Marley was the mother of Madeleine when things happened, and they had his uh, six-month-old little girl, and he would protect them. He was a very special son. He was His relationship to my mother was very special, very loving. His working life, okay. He was an agent for the CTI, CTI, and he knew about telecommunications. He, about, he knew about electronics. That's what he had studied. And he worked in it, intercepting the phone calls that the investigators ordered through their service orders. And in that investigative work, Jorge Luis obtained information about the structures in Santa Marta and Magdalena, that was the Northern Block, Tairona, which was led by Hernan Giraldo Serna. And after that, there were a series of arrests. He was part of that operation. And once they were in the mountains, they were um, attacked by that structure. But Jose Luis was not kidnapped back then because he was very tall, he managed to get away. And he spent two nights hidden to avoid the kidnapping. So he managed um, not to go through that, but he had to hide for two nights. And after those investigations, since he was a very righteous worker, he had great results because he was a great worker. And after that, an explosive, a grenade was um, launched against my mother's house because he lived there. Jorge and I were very close, so he moved to my house. Sorry, Jorge had moved to my house, so actually he was not living there. The grenade blew in my parents' house. Of course, after that, Hernan Giraldo Serna, amazingly, started to speak on the media and said that Jorge Luis de la Rosa was a military target. And that changed our lives because he started to hide. I had to move because they knew where we lived. And my husband was threatened. And they told him for us to stay still. And of course that changed our security structure. And I stopped going to the Huachaca area. I had to keep a low profile to keep my head down until they could um, transfer Jose Luis. And he was transferred to Medellin with his family, which was quite shocking for his family because we had to uh, separate from him, from the babies. So it was a complete chaos. And in Medellin, he started working um, in the same things he did before, intercepting phone calls. That, that's how he worked. And he reported 
that he would ask for political asylum in Canada. He uh, filed a request for asylum until he was appointed in, an, in a special mission. It was a very delicate security situation for us as well. We had to uh, keep our heads down. People started leaving, our neighbors, our friends, our family members. We were left alone and Marley's family as well. We tried it to support each other because we couldn't trust anyone. Everyone was afraid to get too close to us out of fear. And what in what circumstances, from the family point of view, uh, did Jose Luis um, disappear in May 2001? It was a terrible situation because when Jorge told me that uh, he had he would have to start working in investigations, I said, "But aren't you afraid?" And he said, "Well, it's my job." My boss told me to go. He looked up to his boss, to this woman. He, she was a, a star director in the institution. And when we learned about that, about his disappearance, I couldn't understand why, because he always told me that she would be channeling the information, her boss, his boss, sorry, because she, she would be channeling the information because what he was doing was very difficult. He would be informing on the activities of a paramilitary group. So she would be receiving the information. So when this happened, I didn't understand. Apparently they knew about what he was doing they knew his car, how he dressed. They knew everything about him because the information got out of the office. And this famous star director was corrupt and she was fired from the office for corruption. So when we learned about that assignment, we were shocked, we were very afraid. We told him, please try not to speak too much please stay with your security guards. And I never understood why they prolonged his, um, his task, his mission. Thank you, Ms. Jacqueline. And finally, what was the answer of the state's entities who um, in the family filed the reports to try to find Jose Luis, uh, Jorge Luis alive. Well, that was very frustrating because my mother who was very tough when she learned about the disappearance of her youngest child. And we learned, uh, she had a heart attack. And when she had a heart attack, she was shocked. But then a month went by and we went to Cincelejo with his in-laws and our own family. We had to go over there by ourselves and no one would give us an answer. Oh, they disappeared, they disappeared, that was all. They said they were kidnapped. So it was handled as a kidnapping. So as it was a kidnapping, we would ask, well, do you know anything? Have you heard any news? Has anyone got into, has anyone approached you? Have they asked for ransom? My mother and I were so naive. We uh, would actually uh, leave messages to the kidnapping service, messages to our to my brother. So we had hope for almost two years. We thought that he was alive. So we very naively kept on leaving messages for him. We marched we would go to the public prosecutor's office. We would just sit there. She, we, my mother was so desperate that she would ask for hearings at the presidency, at the public prosecutor's office. They closed the investigation about the grenade that blew in our house because they said that was not a crime against humanity. Thank you.
Miss Jacqueline, it's time's up, but you will get a second chance for participation. Thank you so much for your participation. Now we will give the floor to the state. Thank you. First, we want to thank this space. And we would like to express our solidarity for the situation you've been through. And therefore, we are not going to formulate questions. Thank you to the representatives of the state. So now we will give the floor to the commissioners. We will start with Rapporteur Joel Hernandez. Jacqueline, we will ask the questions and then you reply later. Commissioner, thank you, Madam President. I would like to express my solidarity uh, for her to Jacqueline de la Rosa for her irreparable loss, uh, her brother. And her fam I also would like to express my solidarity for her family. I would like to ask a question regarding uh, her brother's disappearance. Do you have any information regarding the investigation into the disappearance? And I would like to know if uh, your family has been informed of the investigation and how uh, the family has participated in said investigation. Thank you, President. The advances of the investigation had been very frustrating because oh, the investigation was because of kidnapping because they would have a fight because they said that it was not kidnapping, it was a disappearance of what they say. And thanks to our lawyer, uh, we were able to uh, change that. But we have no reply on the side of the state because the only thing that was done, I re recall the investigation, I also face uh, the part of the state because they said that they were disappeared and they were thrown away into the sea. The prosecutor office decided to keep that version of the facts and did not conduct any investigation work because we knew that there were state agents that gave all the information to the members of the Grupo Cadena to let him know that, to let them know that my brother was going to go through there. And the uh, persons from the state were betrayed. Um, there was one who told me that they were being betrayed, but that they knew didn't know that, but nobody knows more. We only have the version that they were disappeared and no progress, progress has been made. We try to seek for compensation for the state to take responsibility, but the judicial authorities have rejected our requests. We are insisted on this. We are working in any disappearing processes. Every time that we are invited, we go and we participate in those activities to ask where my father is. We want to know where he is, but the state cannot answer us because they have not investigated. They just have the version that he was disappeared and that's all, but there is no work to search for him. There is no investigation, nothing. Thank you. Vice President Rallon, you have the floor. Thank you, President. I would like to express my solidarity to Jacqueline de la Rosa. Um, I have two questions. The first one, have to do because of the type of work that your brother did. And I would like to know in your opinion and if the information that you had, do you think that he had the protection, the support and the security of the state? That's my first question. And the second has to do with the relationship that the authorities and these out of law groups had. I don't know if you could hear me. The, the sound was not good enough. My second question is, what's the relationship between the authorities and the out of law groups who have, who intervened allegedly the facts? 
uh, as regards the security of my brother, he was alone. He, they only transferred him to Medellin and that was all. They left him there. He never had support. And precisely, he told me, let's go to Canada, let's do the paperwork because he was in fear all the time because there was always someone uh, near the balcony of my mom because these neighborhoods were organized by these same groups, these structures. So they were in the balcony all the time and we couldn't be there. And that was so, so horrible. So there was no security at all. Regarding the relationships between the state of Colombia and these structures or groups, they existed. And I got to learn why, because we were together with the Fabio's family and the, uh, the authorities knew that my brother would not break. He believed in justice. He was against these criminal structures, but he didn't know that his supervisors, his directors, were just there because of those criminal structures. And they had some political influence in the state of Colombia. So that's a way things worked at the time. Thank you. Now I would like to give the floor to Commissioner Clark. Thank you very much, uh, President, and uh, good afternoon. Jacqueline de la Rosa, I join in the words of solidarity over your, your loss. I have four questions for you. Um, the first one, after the grenade, the grenade uh, in your parents' house, was any protection or security extended to your family, to your brother, to your mother um, after that act of violence? That's the first question. Secondly, you, you, your perspective is uh, that persons in his office were corrupt and had to have been involved in sharing information about his work and his whereabouts. Um, has there been any investigation of that office conducted? Thirdly, um, given that the disappearance and, and, and the loss of life is, was so closely linked to the nature of your brother's work, has his family, his wife, his, his children, have they received any financial support from the state? And lastly, if you would, would you characterize for us what your experience has been of the truth and justice and reparations in the justice system? Senora hey. Jacqueline. Miss Jacqueline. I didn't hear the English version. Oh. Sorry, I didn't hear the translation. I couldn't find the translation here. Don't worry, it's okay. I will try to summarize and maybe the petitioners can help with the translation for the next part. Basically what we were asking had to do with the grenade, if you received any protection after this, and if you let us know if how the system of truth and justice of Colombia, if you had any support. I will summarize Commissioner Clark, but I want to summarize at least those two questions. Commissioner, no, President, we... before, before the response, there's one question, if you can translate it for me, I will be so grateful. Okay. The, uh, the question about the, um, the state agents in the office, uh, which the, the assumption is that they were acting on behalf of the paramilitary or they were connected. Has there been any investigation done of that office? Sí, la, la pregunta dice la comisionada. So the question is, has to do with the involvement or the link between state agents and the office. Do you know if there is any specific investigation about the alleged participation of state agents in the facts? No, no. I specifically asked this question to the prosecutors. I asked them if they 
had conducted an investigation, if they knew who these people were, because we know because they were betrayed by state agents, but they didn't conduct any investigation into this. They just said, okay, he was disappeared and they are just investigating the facts for his disappearance, but those, that's all they did. We never received any support, any, uh, they told us, take care and please don't go to the area. I'm a lawyer and I know that there are several hierarchy positions and I decided not to go there because I knew what could happen to me. Thank you, Ms. Jacqueline de Rosa. As my colleagues have said, I would like to express my solidarity for being here. Let's begin with the allegations part. We will have first the petitioners and the state each has 10 minutes and then the commission for five minutes. I would like to give the floor to the petitioners first. Thank you, Madam President. My name is Maria Clara Ramirez. I'm a lawyer of the CSJ, and I would like to report on the case regarding the victims, the alleged victims were forced disappeared in San Onofre by paramilitary groups. With regard to the merits arguments and the responsibility of the state of Colombia, regarding its protection of the rights invoked, we believe that in the 90s and in the 2000s, in the 2000s, there was a situation of violence and this has been proud by the inter-American system in several times. In spite of there are measures to prevent and to sanction paramilitary activities, these were not enough to avoid the serious violations of human rights, including the torture, the uh, murder and disappearance of the victims. And also they did not dismantle the links between state agents and paramilitary groups who participated in the perpetration of the facts. Since 1995 in the regions of, in these regions there were paramilitary groups and the responsibility of the state regarding the duties to prevent and protect this has to do with the lack of dismantling of these paramilitary groups uh, through the creation of paramilitary groups and the lack of prevention and protection of civilians, the state is responsible for all this. Regarding the violation of the rights to legal personality, life integrity, freedom and freedom of movement, uh, since they were state agents, CTI uh, agents, um, should have the necessary protection in order to guarantee their life and integrity. However, sadly, the reality proves different. Uh, their life and their family's lives was full of risks and dangers. Jorge Luis was uh, allegedly kidnapped in 1990. It was it was, uh, there was an attempt of kidnapping while Fabio Luis was kidnapped and they were considered military targets by a commander of the region. And after that, the family members of De La Rosa suffered an attack in their house with a grenade. At the beginning of 2000s, the Specialized Prosecutor Office of Bogota, in spite of the risk that existed, assigned them to investigations for the massacres of El Che and Mancuján, who were committed by the military group of Andesky between uh, the investigations were conducted between April and May. Both investigators were in contact with their families permanently. In May the 25th, they did not communicate and the families suspected that something had happened to them. They tried to look for them and they confirmed that they were disappeared. The question is why, because of this background information, the CTI and the prosecutor office sent the two investigators to a region that was under the control of the paramilitary group that considered them a military target. The, uh, this had the support of state agents, but also these groups receive information and operating support of the state agents. Since the investigators reached the area, this Fabio and the other victim were surveilled by the paramilitary groups. And the groups received information about the 
actions of the investigators. And they receive information from DAS, the CTI and the prosecutor office and the intelligence services. With regard to the violations of human dignity or the dignity of the family of the investigators, Inter-American Court indicates that when there is a forced disappearance, the right to integrity, personal integrity and to life are violated because of the lack of communication with their family members and because the execution of the detainees is alleged. And, or, and also, all evidence related to the crimes is erased. And also, this is especially serious if there is the support and the complicity of the state. The family members of the investigators uh, have been violated their physical and mental integrity due to the disappearance and forced disappearance of their family members. This is even serious or more serious if the suffering of the family members is considered due to the lack of reply of state authorities. After 21 years, the whereabouts of these people are not known. And now I would like to give the floor to my colleague, Daniela Borges. This time I would like to talk about the violations to a right to fair trial and to judicial protection of the family members of the victims. Taken into consideration Articles 8 and 25 of the American Convention, we see that there is a lack of due diligence in the investigation of the facts. Over 21 years later, we have no information about the whereabouts of the victims. We see that the responsibility of the state is proved because of the delay of 11 days that the investigator took to start the investigation for this disappearance. In spite of the fact the family members went to the offices and the reply that they received is that they should wait. They should wait for the investigators to appear. In spite of the fact that there were assumptions that it was a disappear or a forced disappearance, they have no reply, no reaction. La last week, the Colet family was invited or was called by the prosecutor office. And they told them that the remains of uh, his fa their family member was not in the database and the investigations were fruitless because of all the errors committed over all these years. The prosecutor's office, since it was considered that it was an extortive kidnapping and not a forced disappearance, started an investigation that was not about finding the whereabouts of the victims. And also, it was necessary for the office of the prosecutor to conduct the activities in a timely manner to collect the evidence necessary. Also, the investigation was uh, halted by the situation of risks suffered by the prosecutors and the investigators of the instant case. In 2002, some one of the investigators suffered several acts of violence by paramilitary groups. Also, the paramilitary group that attacked the investigator was the same that attacked the victims. And what we see is that the state is not taking the necessary measures to protect their or its officials. Also, we need to take into consideration the sexual violence suffered by two of the victims. Sexual violence has been used as a war weapon. Uh, armed groups have used this to create terror. The Honorable Commission, the UN, and the Institutional or the Constitutional Court of Colombia have determined that this sexual violence is a generalized practice. Therefore, the prosecutor office should include the classification of the relevant crimes taken into consideration the conflict and the actions of the AUC at the time of the facts regarding the processes of the peace process. First, there is no connection between this jurisdiction and the ordinary jurisdiction, since there has been no additional information and there is no actions to search for the victims or to identify the state agents who participated in the disappearance of the investigators. The investigator did not conduct any or collect any other evidence, especially there are some witnesses that could provide information and that give information about the whereabouts of the, of the victims. Also, it's important to take into consideration that the special peace jurisdiction in 2019 ordered some precautionary measures to protect some of the territories and San Onofre. And we know that in those territories, there are many victims of forced disappearance. And also, 
we see that there is information regarding Aida Mendoza whose body could have been recovered, but the searches have not shown any results. We see also that there are many pending search actions that should be conducted. It's important to inform to the commissioners that on March 11, this uh, office was informed of the reparation process and all the actions that were interposed. It, this means that the victims now have no possibility of no domestic remedies to request any reparation or compensation. The, um, taking into consideration the investigation of the forces appearance of this CTI and after 21 years of the facts, what we don't know what really happened in El Palmar. Thank you. Thank you. Now we would like to give the floor to the state for 10 minutes. Thank you very much, commissioners, petitioners, family members of the alleged victims. In this hearing, the delegation representing Colombia will be um, made up of myself, Ana Maria Ordoñez, and my colleagues, Natalia Mora and Andres Sarmiento, who will be uh, sharing the floor with me for 15 minutes in accordance to what was uh, said on the uh, note received on March 8th from Marisol Blanchard. Please let us know if we need clarification. I I'm sorry, I don't understand. I don't know if an, there's an audio problem. You you have a 10 minute um, argument. Uh, your allotment for the argument is 10 minutes. Yes, but I would ask you to stop the uh, timer now. We received a note on April 8th, sorry, that said that we could speak for 15 minutes. We're talking about a note from March 8th, 2022. The final paragraph about the uh, state's closing remarks. Of course, we won't mind if the other party uses five more minutes. Madam Representative, when I started the hearing, I said that it would be 10 minutes per party. Ms. Blanchard, could you please clarify this? Of course, Madam President. Yes, it's 10 minutes to uh, present the arguments and another five minutes uh, to reply. So that's 15 minutes in total. Thank you very much. Since these um, cases, hearings are so common um, and we always participate in them, I thought this was clear. You have 10 minutes. Um, for the arguments, and then another five minutes. Okay. Could you please confirm you can hear me? Are you prepared? Before presenting our arguments, sorry, Madam Representative, Madam, okay, because of the sad situation faced by the family members of the victims, Excuse me, ma'am, ma'am, representative of the state, can't you hear me? Can you hear me, ma'am? Yes. We will start again. I'm sorry, we will start again because we um, are very respectful with the time allotments. Once the president says you can begin, you can begin, um, you should do that. Now we can start. You have 10 minutes, please. OK. Can you hear me? Before presenting our allegations on behalf of the Colombian state, we would like to express our solidarity to this difficult situation faced by the family members of Mr. Mejia, Mr. Coley, and Ms. Perez, and Ms. Padilla Mercado because of what took place on May 2000, their disappearance and murder and the consequences of them for their family members are regrettable and should not have happened. 
we will now show that the once the Colombian state heard about what had happened, works to seek the alleged victims begun and also to investigate and to judge and sanction those responsible. The state never stopped working towards this. And thanks to the work of the institutions of the Colombian state so far, there is clarity on what happened to the victims. We also have criminal convictions against the members of the paramilitary group that was responsible for this. And the family members of the victims have had an opportunity to um, seek um, domestic justice. And the internal domestic justice will be able to judge the responsibility of the state. Now, because of the things that happened, some family members also went to the uh, victims' reparations um, administrative courts and received compensation. In this case, the institutions of the state of Colombia to face these regrettable facts worked executively to um, compensate the human rights violations. That is why it is the state of Colombia should not be uh, blamed for this. And the commission should recognize the efforts of the state and the results of those efforts. My colleagues will address some aspects that will show the commissioners this conclusion. First of all, we will talk about the development of the criminal actions. Then we will explain the search for the alleged victims, which continue to take place. And very respectfully, we would like to say, explain Ms. La Rosa about the current situation of the search efforts, maybe directly or through her attorneys. We would like to clarify what they said about the registry of the victims at CPEC. Finally, we will talk about the direct compensation given to the family members of some victims. And fourth, we will explain the reasons why the commission should not um, assess the uh, violation of the um, Inter-American Convention on uh, the Forced Disappearance of Persons and the Convention to Prevent and Sanction Torture. Finally, we would explain why the facts of this case are not a forced disappearance in the terms um, defined by the international system. The state has uh, carried out a criminal investigation. The public prosecutor's office began as soon as it heard of the facts. It began an investigation on May 29, 20, 2001. The honorable commissioners, the state, she began again, started uh, to investigate this as soon as it heard of the facts. On May 29th, 2001, it received a, a, a report on the first disappearances. The following day, on the 30th, the investigation was officially opened for the kidnapping of the four alleged victims. Afterwards, when more information was received, the uh, criminal category changed to uh, forced disappearance and uh, homicide. In this investigation, 11 possible um, perpetrators were identified. 70 actions for proof were approved. We would like also to say that an interinstitutional commission was created by the CTI and the DG. As a result of the investigations, only three years after the facts took place in 2004, three perpetrators were uh, prosecuted, among them Rodrigo Antonio Peluf. In 2008, a trial began against another two suspects, along and also in 2009 and 2010. Among the new uh, perpetrators or suspected perpetrators was one of the ones mentioned today. 
and they were the main responsible for the paramilitary group. And this was all possible thanks to the work of the Office of the Public Prosecutor. That is what, why we would like to say that the criminal investigation was an effective and adequate remedy. Additionally, the state managed to sanction and convict those responsible for the facts. Between 2010 and today, five verdicts were issued against the members of the paramilitary group for forced disappearance and homicide. The commission should also understand that the uh, those prosecuted were investigated under the domestic law. And between 2009 and 2011, several witnesses state, uh, stated where the bodies could be found. This occurred on October 27, 2009. We should also point out, commissioners, that the state also worked, that it is evident that the state worked to clarify these facts. And it all occurred um, relatively soon, especially considering how complex this affair was. This should be said about the fact that these are complex facts. Um, we're talking about a forced disappearance with about 15 perpetrators, and 11 of them were criminally prosecuted. We're talking about several victims and um, many years that went by after the facts took place. I will now give the floor to Andres. Commissioners, apart from the investigation of the facts and the trial and conviction of those responsible, the state also worked diligently in trying to find the bodies. First of all, the following days after learning of the disappearances, the state ordered several entities to seek for them. Between 2001 and 2009, approximately 10 actions were carried out to find the bodies, and they included uh, inspections in the El Palmar properties, where it was believed that the uh, remains had been buried. 65 graves were found there, but none of the remains found belonged to the victims. Additionally, since 2009, the searching efforts have been in charge of the group for identification and delivery of disappeared persons. Another, uh, other remains were found, but they were uh, not the remains of the alleged victims. Another problem has to do with the fact that according to recent versions, the remains were recovered and uh, thrown to the sea by the mili paramilitary groups. But we would like to say that we are working on testing the veracity of these um, versions so as to know how to move forward in the search process. Commissioners, as you can observe, the state has been diligent in judging and san sanctioning those responsible for these facts and also in trying to find the remains. And that is why we must talk about the case law of the court, inter-American court, that says that when the state has complied with its obligations, there should be no study of other violations to human rights. And that is the case we are studying right now because the state has fulfilled the obligations of Articles 8 and 25. So the commission should, apply, uh, should apply the principle of subsidiarity and refrain from investigating the violation of other articles in the American Convention. Thank you very much. Now we will start with the second part of five minutes with the petitioners. Thank you, Madam President. We will uh, reply. Testimonios dados por Laura Colei y la señora Jacqueline de la Rosa. Eh, tenemos que. Based on what was said by um, the witnesses, we believe it is clear that the state is responsible for action, omission, its acquiescence in the work 
of the paramilitary groups that led to these forced disappearances. So we hope that the uh, state will be held responsible for these facts and also the violation against uh, the personal integrity. And this appears on Article 1 of the American um, Declaration Convention Against Forced Disappearances. We would also like to very respectfully ask the Commission to recommend the state to deepen its investigations because clearly they have not been able to identify the, um, res those responsible within the state entities who uh, gave away the location of the investigators who were disappeared. And also uh, an investigation should be carried out about the possible sexual violence the women might have suffered. Also, a multidisciplinary investigation should be carried out to identify the, um, the location of the remains. And you can find a dossier about the um, measures for reparation that the families believe that would repair the responsibility, uh, sorry, the damage that uh, they suffered because of the responsibility of the state. Now I would like to talk about the two aspects mentioned by the state. The first one has to do with the criminal aspect. The representatives of the state argue that Bototo, that, that sorry, that it exhausted all the um, domestic remedies to judge all the paramilitary um, members. But the truth is that uh, none of them have to do with the participation of state agents. And as we said, within the um, decision that was ruled by a local court last week, the document says that uh, they don't really know what happened, but the state said that they are completely clear about what happened. So what is the official version? Last week, a judge said that they, they don't know. And secondly, about the um, sexual violence that might have been exerted against the female victims in this case, because they did not investigate that. Now, with regards to the uh, search efforts, there wasn't a comprehensive plan they did three attempts, but they were all disorganized. As the state's representative said, they found 65 graves and 32 persons, but there isn't an actual, um, there wasn't an actual comparison between the remains that were found and the DNA samples taken from the family members. So we don't know if among these remains, this four persons uh, that they might be among um, these 32 bodies. And according to the states, once they learned that the remains might have been thrown to the sea, they halted the search and nothing has been done. Only the uh, special jurisdiction for peace has been working for this. And as we said, it was done in a disorganized manner. There are still, there is there is still a long list of pending uh, actions as we mentioned in our closing remarks. And finally, I think that it has been proven that the state not only did not comply with its obligation to uh, respect Articles 8 and 25, but quite the contrary, it has violated that through several of its actions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now I will give the floor to the state for five minutes. Thank you, Madam President. In these facts, we will in these five minutes, I would like to address the comments made by the victims. I, I would like to express 
why the facts related to the death and the disappearance of the alleged victims uh, cannot be attributed to the state. First, with regard to the threats that existed, the state did all the actions possible to protect the lives of the alleged victims. Therefore, uh, the work that they were conducting at the time of the facts was at a place 350 kilometers away from the place in which they were threatened two years ago. The, additionally, the paramilitary groups that committed both facts are different. This is an aspect that should be assessed by the Inter-American Commission. Secondly, the criminal file shows that it is an alleged complicity of, of state agents taking into consideration that some paramilitary members said in their statements that alias El Cojo and El Guajiro uh, warned about the presence of the investigators in the area. With regard to this item, there are a lot of versions uh, that said that alias Cardenas known about the presence of the victims by means of an informant of the group. This is the information that was corroborated, judicially speaking, in the convictions against the paramilitary members. Also, some uh, witnesses uh, belonging to parliamentary groups said this, but nobody says that Alice Cadena received that call. They said because someone else said that that happened, but there is not concrete information about that happening. Also, we would like to highlight the investigation work conducted to identify alias El Cojo or El Guajiro and to analyze if there was an involvement of his, of his part in the facts. But the person is currently dead. Regarding the alleged complicity of this agent, that is not enough to uh, classify the fact as forced disappearance commissioners. If that hypothesis, which has not been proved, were true, the involvement of that state agent was limited to informing about the presence of the alleged victims in the region. But that is not enough to determine the participation of state agents in the disappearance of the alleged victims. Additionally, the state also recognizes that it has acted with due diligence and through its different units of justice and peace has analyzed the situation. That analysis has been done by, with different state agents, including public entities, municipal authorities, uh, law enforcement bodies, and there are only links with some specific facts. For example, uh, for example, the use of fire weapons or firearms in some specific cases, murder of protected persons, and the legal use of uh, different symbols on the participation of state agents in intelligent works. But this general context that has been proved had no incidence in this concrete case or the instant case. And that does not represent uh, or that doesn't mean that there is an international responsibility on the side of the state. There should be a causal relationship between the two things. So the allegation regarding the general context of tolerance on the side of the stand, uh, state towards paramilitary groups has nothing to do with the situation of the alleged victims in this case. In addition, the reconstruction of the facts in the criminal proceeding taken into consideration the evidence that has been assessed shows that the facts were committed by paramilitary groups without any mediation or direct or indirect by state agents. As a result, commissioners, the state considers or estimates that these facts could not be attributed to its responsibility. First, the version regarding the fact that the bodies were thrown away to the sea is a version from 2001. Up to now, there has been no investigation work. First, it's necessary to corroborate how true that version is in order to conduct fa uh, further work. Thank you. Thank you. Now we would like to give the floor to the commissioners. I would like to ask my 
colleagues if they have a specific question and if they want to and if that they tell me who the question is for i would like to start with the carty rapporteur do you have any questions thank you madam president i have a question for the state i would like for them to share with us the actions of support or psychological support or material or economic support they have conducted through the prosecutor office or any other state authority to for the victim for the family members of the alleged victims the state can answer now you are on mute uh, sir commissioner the state will send that answer in writing to give detailed information about the support provided. Vice President Rolón. Thank you, President. I have two questions for the state. Uh, for time restrictions, they can send them in writing. Um, first, my question is, can you clarify how many people have been convicted for the facts how many people are being investigated for the facts and how many people are still in a, in a pending legal proceeding for the facts. We would like to have detailed information of the person involved in each of these categories. And my second question is, is there are state agents that are being investigated right now for the facts related to this case? Please send the answers in writing, thank you. Um, the representatives of the state would like to answer now, or are they sending the answers in writing? Sorry, Madam President, I'm going to send the, we are going to give an initial answer and then we will supplement by in writing. Right now, there are four people who have been convicted for the facts. They all be linked to the paramilitary group Bloque Eres de los Montes de Marías. Two of them are the most important uh, because of their position in the group. Also, we have 11 people who are uh, still related to the proceeding, and we will send you detailed information because they are in different stages of the proceeding. Some people were aware of the facts, but they were not involved in the facts, allegedly. Thank you. Commissioner Roberta Clark, do you have any questions? Yes, I do. Thank you very much, President. I have uh, two questions for the state and one question for the petitioners. Uh, for the state, I understand the petitioner's um, claim is that the state failed in its duty to prevent and protect, to prevent the forced disappearance and to protect against that. And the state failed in doing that because, in fact, both, um, both, uh, both victims had experienced violence before, one uh, kidnapping and another one uh, grenade attack on, on his mother's house so that there was a clear risk and a history of uh, violent targeting. And in that circumstance, the state did not do what it should have done to protect and prevent um, the harm that, that eventually uh, occurred. So I would like to uh, um, ask you, how would you respond to that, um, that, that, that assertion and what in fact did the state do to prevent and protect against harm? Uh, that's the first question. And secondly, I understand the petitioners are saying that the state had a duty to investigate, uh, a do, to, to conduct a due diligence investigation into whether or not state actors were um, involved act, uh, actively or through omission in, uh, when I say omission, through acquiescence in the, in the forced disappearance of the two victims. My question for the state is, what do you, what would you consider to be the elements of a due diligence investigation into whether or not state actors were involved in the disappearances and what in fact did the state do to investigate that allegation of connection between state actors and the prior military group? And, um, uh, yes, yes. Commissioner, let give the floor to the state to finish this part and I will give you the floor for the petitioners. The state has the floor. Thank you, Commissioner, for your question. With regard to the risk that the alleged victims suffer due to their work in Santa Marta, the state took all the necessary measures and within its scope or its reach, to prevent this risk. First, 
and as it has been pointed out before, the measure that was taken is to transfer the alleged victims. And that transfer was uh, due to, and well, the place was taken into consideration so that the victims had no risk in terms of their integrity and their life. It's important to mention that Tunja and Medeji are cities that are far away from Santa Marta. And certainly there could be a distance of around 500 kilometers. And in this regard, this is the most important measure that was taken by the state. And also they were allowed to continue doing their work in a daily manner where they were assigned. Uh, Ms. Commissioner, with regard to the investigation with the diligence into the involvement of state agents, the state has exhausted all the investigation lines regarding that alleged involvement. First, as we mentioned, in the instances of justice and peace, the context of participation of state agents with the paramilitary group Heroes de Montes de Maria has been established. However, there is no action that indicates that the facts are related to these links. Second, in the specific case within the ordinary jurisdiction, the line of investigation regarding a person that was uh, a whistleblower in the uh, office. However, these lines of investigations, in some cases, said that this person only provided information regarding CTI, but there is no other evidence in the proceeding in spite of all the investigati investigative work that there was another whistleblower within the state. And as my uh, colleague Andres said, those lines or those versions that pointed to a police uh, whistleblower were only a few versions against most of the versions who confirmed that there was a whistleblower from the civilian world. And those were paramilitary groups who weren't about the presence of CTI members because they had a, uh, a, um, a camera or some elements that would lead to them being investigators. Thank you. Commissioner, do you have the question for the petitioners? Commissioner Clark, do you have any questions yes. for the petitioners? Yes, I do. Um, yes, I do. Uh, petitioners, I was just again wanting to uh, think more carefully about the connection that you are alleging between state actors and the paramilitary group. And I'm wondering, um, whether or not you have some concrete evidence of that or whether or not you're suggesting that a presumption arises because it's so difficult to prove, a presumption arises based on the context, the conduct and the outcome, which is the disappearances of, of the, the, the two victims and others. You can answer petitioners. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, definitely, Commissioner Clark, it is difficult to prove this relationship, this link. Uh, but what we have been able to determine within the criminal investigation that there were not sufficient actions to clarify this connection. Uh, as the representative of the state say, we have that El Cojo Guajiro has died. So the only person that could prove that connection is dead. So the same happens with the paramilitary leader of the Bloque Eres de las Montes de Maria, who is disappeared right now. He has been convicted, but his whereabouts, whereabouts are not known. So uh, on the side of the paramilitary groups, those were the only persons who knew about the connection between the state agents and paramilitary groups. What we can say about the case is that the different pieces of evidence included in the criminal proceedings and in indicia of the proceeding is indicate that there is a collaboration between the state and the paramilitary groups, especially in this region, that's on one side. And on the other side, for example, the witness that who is a civilian 
that warns the paramilitary groups that the investigators are in there together with these women. This civilian started a criminal complaint for false testimony against the paramilitary group. So what we can conclude uh, about the investigation is that nothing has been duly, duly clarified at the time. And we need to have more actions regarding the disappearance or the whereabouts of the victims and the search for justice. Thank you. I have one more question. I will ask it, but you can send the answer in writing. And this question is for the state and for the petitioners. And it's a very specific question. We have gone over the case in general terms, but I have a specific question regarding the cases of Saif, Elena Mendoza, and Aida Mercado, so that the petitioners can provide a specific information, gender affectation, so that the state can also provide information if the investigation has a gender perspective and how. That is the question that I have for you, and I know that it can uh, get uh, connected in that regard. I have to close the meeting, the hearing now. I would like to thank the state for being here. The commission appreciates you being here. This accounts for your desire to contribute to inter-American standards and to this dialogue in this case hearing. Secondly, I would like to thank the uh, big the, Laura and Jacqueline de la Rosa for being here. And uh, not for being here today, but also for your joint work for searching for the truth, justice, and memory. The Inter-American Commission will continue working in this matter. And I would like to conclude this hearing, considering the fact that we are in March, that last week was the International Women's Day. And I would like to indicate that on March the 8th, the Inter-American Commission published a press release uh, calling upon combating violence against women in situations of dictatorship and conflict. This is a release about the gender perspective, but also the building of memory, truth, and justice. And we will continue developing our standards, our work. And again, thank you for being here today. I would like to conclude the meeting by thanking my colleagues, the commissioners, the assistant executive secretary, and the team of the Inter-American Commission that is always here. They're always paying attention and doing their best so that these hearings are the best and for the Inter-American justice to consolidate. Thank you. I would like to adjourn this hearing. See you soon. Thank you.